So hello everybody, this is Bante Joe here and I'm just here on the rock uh, outside the Dahatunukuti, or a rock, a large rock and thought to record a short Dhamma discussion for the internet so I thought that maybe we could start with just a little meditation so we can lean forward a bit and arch the spine and look about three feet in front <coughs> and close our eyes and can spread thoughts of goodwill to our right hand side <coughs> Wishing may all beings to my right be happy and at ease. May they put in place the causes necessary to be happy and at ease. And we can make the mind infinite. Can make it unbounded. All the way to the ends of the universe and beyond. <coughs> in every dimension. May all beings to my right be happy and at ease. And we can spread thoughts of goodwill to our right hand side <coughs> and our left hand side. Wishing may all beings to my right and my left be happy and at ease. May they put in place the causes necessary to be happy and at ease. <coughs> And we can spread thoughts of goodwill to our right hand side, our left hand side, <coughs> and in front. May all beings to my right, my left, and in front be happy and at ease. May they put in place the causes necessary to be happy and at ease. <coughs> And we can spread thoughts of goodwill to our right hand side, <coughs> our left hand side, in front, behind, <coughs> all around in all four directions. May all beings in all four directions be happy and at ease. <coughs> May they put in place the causes necessary to be happy and at ease. And we can spread thoughts of goodwill to our right hand side, <coughs> our left hand side, in front, behind, and above. May all beings in all four directions and above be happy and at ease. May they put in place the causes necessary to be happy and at ease. And we can spread thoughts of goodwill to our right hand side, our left hand side, in front, behind, above, below, all around in every direction, everywhere. <coughs> 
May all beings all around in every direction, everywhere, be happy and at ease. May they put in place the causes necessary to be happy and at ease. And we can make the mind infinite, can make it unbounded, all the way to the ends of the universe and beyond, in every dimension. May all beings all around everywhere be happy and at ease. <clears throat> And can open our eyes and do a short Dhamma discussion for the internet. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Uttang Sarananga Chami Dhammang Sarananga Chami Sangang Sarananga Chami Dutiyampi Buddhang Sarananga Chami Dutiyampi Dhammang Sarananga Chami Dutiyampi Sangang Sarananga Chami Tatiyampi Buddhang Sarananga Chami Tatiyampi Dhammang Sarananga Chami Tatiyampi Sangang Sarananga Chami So I hope that everybody's having a great day wherever it might be. And uh, we've now entered Vasa here um, here at the monastery and uh, the monks in the solitary kutis. So I'm now staying in this uh, solitary kuti for Vasa, which is a lovely opportunity. And I uh, got a question from, uh, from somebody I know in the Toronto area the other day. And he asked, uh, can you, uh, paraphrase the question, can you give basically a proper definition of anatma along with a few examples? <clears throat> and so the Buddha's teachings on anatta uh, or not self were kind of, uh, were kind of different from, the, from many other samana schools uh, in his time. Uh, basically, uh, there was a search for an ending to suffering and it seems that it may have been the case that some schools saw this search or at least in later centuries possibly in the Buddhist time saw this search as uh, ending when one found one's true self so when the Buddha formulated his teachings he taught that any basic concept of a self when one thinks of a self it's an object of attachment and that object of attachment prevents one from attaining Nibbana so he teaches about not-self, that basically all what they call sankharas or compounded things are not-self. They come together, uh, they're made up of things that are subject to change. And when those things that it's made up of are subject to change, then, uh, <laughs> then the, whatever thing is made from those compounded parts can change as well. So... Uh, he teaches, he gives examples, some examples for things like consciousness, like um, if, for example, the oil in the lamp is impermanent, if the casing of the lamp is impermanent, how could the flame be permanent? And so, uh, so in a similar way, whatever it is that's made up of compounded things can't be oneself. It's not something that one can say, let this be thus, let this not be thus. In other words, it's not something that's under one's control, it's not something that's one's belonging. And so it should, re should be regarded as this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. So as an example, people often in the West when I was growing up, um, at least, uh, there was a very strong viewpoint that basically everything that made up a person was made up with the physical components of the body, more or less. That the mind was a function of the brain and that this body... Um, was what made one perceive and think and feel and these kind of things. So it was all bound up with the body. And when the body passed away, then 
it was the elimination of, uh, of a person. Whatever. And so with this view, um, one would think that the body was oneself, uh, that this body is oneself. And this kind of view had many kind of subtle subtleties to it. When, when one thinks of, okay, this is my friend John, for example, one thinks of his face, one thinks of his body. And then also when one thinks of oneself, one thinks of one's face, one thinks of, one can think of one's, uh, what, one's, uh, what one's physical body looks like. And so what this tends to do, if one grabs onto that, if one grabs onto this idea that this, this body is myself, then when wrinkles start to show up on one's face, if one suffers an accident and one can't do things that um, uh, one can't, one's body doesn't work in the way that it used to work, then one suffers a lot. As one builds this idea of what oneself is uh, on the basis of something like a body. Somebody thinks, you know, I'm a very fast runner and then uh, they break their leg or they lose a foot, then they can't be a fast runner uh, after that. And as a result, um, they suffer if they've built up a sense of self around the body. So the body is something that the Buddha teaches is not self. One kind of cultivates this perception that this body is not self. And in doing so, if one detaches from the body, one doesn't suffer when the body changes. And it's a similar thing for the other things that people may think are oneself. Like people oftentimes think that the personality is oneself. I kind of um, remember when I was in university, there was a fellow who went away on exchange. And he said, you know, when he came back, he said, you know, I, I realized that, um, you know, when you go out, uh, when you go out different places, what you always carry with you is that essence, you know, who you really are, that essence of who you are. And this is a kind of view that most many people have. I'm this personality. I have these characteristics. I have these strengths. I have these weaknesses. But of course, one can suffer quite a lot when one's personality changes. When one's skills and abilities change and one's sense of who one is starts to fall away. So remember um, another time... Uh, I had uh, one friend um, when we were in high school, and he was very popular with the ladies. He was kind of a gift of the gab. And uh, at a later time, maybe several years later, he started to, his gift of the gab started to, uh, maybe got distracted, maybe different things going on in his life, but he wasn't able to use his gift of the gab in the same way. And it was quite a lot of suffering, kind of, that this thing, uh, this skill uh, or ability that was part of one's personality fell away. Or one might think of oneself, you know, that they're a very intelligent person and that they're somebody who can really articulate their word well and, you know, write well or whatever it may be. And then if, if something happens such that one loses that ability, and kind of one um, is no longer seen as smart or intelligent by people or smarter or more smart, more intelligent people come along, one can suffer. <clears throat> so the Buddha teaches that these things that make up one's personality, these also are not self. So the perceptions that one has, they're not self. So the mental formations, the emotions that one has, they're not self. And the feelings that one has, kind of, <coughs> um, whether it's kind of uh, mainly pleasant, mainly neutral, mainly bad feelings, they're also not self. These things are all subject to change. And if one cultivates this perception, then it can separate one's mind from these emotions, from <coughs> these mental factors, and so if they change, then one doesn't have to suffer when they change, along with their changing. <clears throat> and then the Buddha also teaches that consciousness is not self, whatever it is that's watching, that this is dependent on external objects. So his teachings on not self are meant to, they kind of have an end in sight, so they, they have a purpose to them, they're part of a strategy or a way of teaching, so that whatever it is that is possible to be grasped onto, a person doesn't grasp onto it. That one uses one's practice of the Dhamma in such a way that one <coughs> detaches from coarser to more and more refined layers of things that one might attach to. So at the very basis, one learns to detach <coughs> from uh, very coarse emotions. And then one learns to detach from more refined emotions. As one starts to learn to meditate, 
then if one can generate states of pleasure, states of happiness in one's meditation, one will tend to uh, take the weight off the external world, what they call the sensual world, and put more the weight of one's need for attachment on these uh, pleasant emotions. But the Buddha teaches that even these are not self, so one is also looking for a way to undercut them. So his path the road is looking for a way to go beyond things that are conditioned to find something that's unconditioned. So one even learns to find uh, the suffering, uh, the way that these things uh, are not self, are changing in very pleasant mental states. And in ancient Indian philosophy or Indian philosophy, when one sometimes achieved these uh, very deep states that the Buddha calls jhanas, people would look at that as union with the Brahma and say that at that point one's quest was finished, one's quest for rebirth was finished, uh, something that might be, um, might be so happy, might be so pleasant. And so the Buddha teaches that even that is not self to undercut so that a person continues to look, so that a person continues to try to refine their search to try to find something that lies beyond uh, the range of the six senses, lies beyond what he calls the all. And this thing that lies beyond the all is Nibbana. The Buddha teaches that even Nibbana is not self because there's basically nothing that one can use to describe it. And then some meditators through um, delighting in the Buddha's teachings will uh, will uh, have their minds launch out, or uh, maybe not launch out, but they have their minds kind of become attracted to the idea of Nibbana. And so even this can serve as, a, uh, as something that people build the self around, a subtle sense of self, a subtle sense of possession, which stops them from actually realizing it. So the Buddha even teaches that his teachings himself are not self. They're to be used like a raft for crossing over the river. And once the one gets to the far side of the river, one's to abandon them because these are the things that one uses to successively let go of layers of attachment. But at the end, even the Dhamma itself uh, can serve as an attachment for people. So uh, the Buddha in the suttas teaches that there's some people who have this Dhamma delight and Dhamma passion, and that's what stops them from attaining Nibbana. So this teaching of the Buddhas that are not self is something that's meant to be used as a strategy. Its purpose is a strategy. It's a perception that one cultivates with regards to successively more refined layers of practice for the sake of going beyond, for the sake of going beyond things that one attaches to, for the sake of finding a state beyond attachment, and for the state of finding, for the sake of finding a happiness that doesn't rely on things that change. And that's the end of suffering when one doesn't have to crave after things that are shaky, that are stable, that are wobbly, that are anicca, impermanent, that are suffering, dukkha, and that are not self, that are anatta. Okay, so think that, leave that for reflection, and hope that everybody has a great day wherever it might be, and wishing all the blessings of Dhamma practice.